signs of a healthy church. Last Sunday, out of the second chapter, 41 through 47, we studied uh, 10 signs that were given in that passage about a healthy church. And one of them that he mentioned in there, I'm bringing back today, and that is addition. The Lord is adding to the church. The Lord is adding to the church. And this is a theme in the book of Acts. If, if, you, if you look at the word add or increase, it becomes a very important, these are important words in the book of Acts. As the church is in development, uh, moving from uh, Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, uh, and you begin to see Paul in his missionary trips beginning to what we call plant churches throughout the Roman Empire. You stop to think about missionary evangelism. It's amazing what Paul, the Apostle Paul did in less, less than 40 years. Less than 40 years. He gets saved. He gets some saved about 36, 33, 36 in there. Dies in about 68. Listen, he swept the Roman Empire. He swept the Roman Empire with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He swept it. There's probably no other power in the world at that period in Romans history that could have swept the Roman Empire that quickly. Think about that. Just as a historian. There's something pretty powerful behind that movement, wasn't there? As the Lord, the Lord adding to the church daily. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Well, here we are in Acts, the ninth chapter. I'm looking at verse 31 on that idea, 931. It says, so the church, notice that singular. So the church, and he's talking about the Christian church. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, Just think about this. We, I mean, we haven't, we haven't hardly moved in time any length. Acts 1.8, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That word no more fell from the lips before we were already there. <laughs> hey. If you know anything about the fall of, Ro of, of Israel to Rome, I mean, this is Rome trying to take down one city with God's help, I might add, under fifth cycle. What happened from Pentecost and fulfilling the promise of Acts 8 1, 1 8, in no time at all, we have swept through Jerusalem, we have swept through Judea, and swept through Samaria. Listen to this. I'm in Acts 9. Acts 9. This is the great passage where Paul gets converted. I mean, Acts 9. I mean, you're talking about nothing. I mean, it's three years at the most, and we're already there. And then they get bogged down, and, and, and then Paul comes along, pushes Gentile ministry, and off we go. It's a, the book of Acts is a pretty amazing book. Here we are in verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace. 
that's from persecution because of Acts 1.8. Listen, if you don't do Acts 1.8, then you wind up doing 8.1. If you don't do 1.8, you'll do an 8.1. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it says, but this is what's happened. And, and, and persecution swept along with it, of course, the angelic conflict. I mean, the devil ain't giving up anything easily, so to speak. And so we have, so the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace from persecution being built up and going on in the fear. That is the feeling of reverent awe that we talked about last time. Enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear or the feeling of reverent awe that was talked about in the second chapter of Acts of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. The church, it continued to increase. So you always pay attention in the book of Acts to the words, the Lord is adding to the church and he's increasing it. But that is the story of the book of Acts in regard to the church. In Acts 2, what is interesting about Acts 2 is that you have the local church and the universal church is one. And that's really unique. The church at Jerusalem in Acts 2 is also the universal church. That's the one time it is one. And that's an interesting point you keep in mind. The Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem continued this way all the way to Acts 8. Great persecution came along and forced them into missionary evangelism of Acts 1-8. This is a very important period in the book of Acts, chapters 2 through 8. That's really important that you get, grasp that as the church because today the local church is all over the world. We send missionaries, and they just plant churches like crazy, like Billy, and, and the, the Morgans in the Philippines, and the Williams in South America, and the Molinars over in South Africa, the Sextons, wherever they are. <laughs> Hope the Lord knows where they are, because I don't. I have no idea where this couple is. Uh, of course, the Lord knows where they are. Then we have the broadheads going. We call them troubleshooters. That's what Paul, Paul used these guys as troubleshooters, sent them out there to, to undergird and help the, the churches that were being planted to teach the word of God, to, to increase their spiritual momentum. I mean, it's a, it's a, by the way, that's a sign of a healthy church. That's a sign of a healthy church. So from Acts 2 to Acts 8, We've got something going that's really interesting, and then they're beginning to move. That local church in Jerusalem is now beginning to move, moving through Judea and Samaria, Galilee. It's on the move. The church is on the move. But it's the Jewish Christian church that's on the move. It's not till Paul comes along. Actually, it's Peter. Peter entered in Acts 10. Nine, Paul gets converted. In chapter 10 and 11, we have Cornelius, a Gentile. God sends Peter to bring him into the church. And a new day dawns. Paul, out of nine, gets converted in nine. We have Gentiles coming in 10 and 11. Paul enters back into the picture in chapter 11. And the rest is, as we say, history. Paul takes it and runs to the Gentiles, runs the Gentiles across the Roman Empire, which is an amazing thing, an amazing thing, an amazing thing. When Paul, Barnabas gets Paul, goes and gets Paul from Tarsus, his hometown, and brings him to Antioch of Syria, a church that had been through, through missionary work from from Acts 8, a group there is re a group out of Pentecost it, going through suffering is now in Antioch of Syria 
reaching, reaching Gentiles with the gospel of Christ. While Peter's doing it, others are doing it as well. Barnabas picks up Paul, brings him in there. And Paul said, did you know, how did you get my name? He said, the Lord gave it to me. And he said, well, did you know ahead of time that I, God has called me to be a, 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 a minister to the Gentiles? Barnabas said, no, I just knew you were an enemy of the church. That's all I knew about you. I knew you had a bad reputation with the church. But I've heard that you are doing marvelous things, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he gets him and brings him along with Barnabas, who's been sent up to check on this church, this group that has gathered a holding Bible study up in Antioch of Syria. He picks up, goes up and looks at him, goes, gets Paul, brings Paul in. And Paul grabs that church and takes them to another level. And that church sponsors first and second missionary trips of Paul to the Gentiles. Pretty amazing. You know what that tells me? Listen to me. And don't ever forget that God's in control. You know who's the head of the church? The Lord. It ain't the Pope. It's not Ron Adema. Not that I'm putting myself in the same category. Neither one of us. Neither one of us the head of the church. If you study the Bible, you'll find out the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Lord who was adding to the church every day. <laughs> it was the Lord. Listen, Luke makes that very clear in the book of Acts. And, and of course, when we study it, we, we, we understand the same thing. And so all of a sudden, we have Paul on missionary trips, I believe four. I believe Paul went on four missionary trips. We don't have the fourth one unless you study the book of Romans. He does three in the book of Acts. Well, it's very clear in Acts, the 16th chapter, verse 9 and, nine and 10, God told Paul on that second missionary trip, I want you to go westward. And if you know anything of our studies, you know that. And he went eastward and got delayed. Jonah, you get delayed when you don't go the way God tells you to go. And then he gets back, and between the third and his death, I believe he went to what was on his passion, Spain. And that takes, that swept that swept the gospel all the way into Europe. I believe that out of Romans 14, 24 through 29. So I want to talk about four things this morning in my hour. One, there's only one Christian church in the world today. I'm going to let that sink in a little minute. There's only one. Now, there are a lot of denominations who fight over theology. They should not be fighting over theology. But I don't care how many denominations are, there's only one church. And listen to me, when Jesus Christ comes back the second time, he'll only take one church. He's coming back for the one church. There is not a whole bunch of churches. Now, there are local churches, but there's only one church for which Christ died for. How do you know who belongs to that church? The person who believes that he died on that cross for their sins was buried and raised from the dead to the third day. If you believe that, you're in his church. If you don't believe that, you're not in his church. You're not in his church. Oh, yes, listen to me. Acts 20, 28 tells you that. He purchased the church with his blood. Care. Listen, other than that, you're a religion. I don't care what title you give your church. I don't care what you call it. If you're going to be a member of that one church, when Jesus Christ comes back, he comes back for that group of people, one church. 
You just need to be sure that if you're in some kind of a denomination, you got the gospel right, both in the message and the mechanics, because that's the church he's coming back for. He's not coming back for the one that's got a sign outside. He's got to look for sign, signs outside a building and take it. You got to be born again. You got to be born again. Be on guard for yourself and for the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Not coming back for people that he hasn't purchased with his blood. They're going to be left. They'll go through a tribulation. They will really know what it's like to go through hell on earth. From Acts, the second chapter through 14, when you study it, there is still one church. But there are two now, there has developed two different theological views in it. And therefore, a church conference was called to clear it up. There was one church with two theological contrasting views on salvation. And Acts 15 cleared it up. There was the Jewish legalistic church that said you had to believe the gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and be circumcised in order to be saved. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's not true, and you will not get saved by that. You are saved by grace through faith, and not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works. And Paul makes that very clear at the church conference he and Barnabas. Peter, in Acts 15, at this church conference, had to agree with him because of Cornelius. In Acts 10 and 11. And so they, they, they work to resolve the theology behind the mechanics and the, mes and the message and the mechanics of salvation. Yes, the gospel is Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. That's the message. The mechanics, you must believe it. You are saved by faith through grace and not of yourself. And so the argument is, pos is posed in Acts 1 through 5 and is cleared up in verse 11 that we believe that all people are saved the same way through the message of the gospel and the mechanics of, of grace and faith. Faith takes, you, faith takes you to grace, and grace does the work of your salvation because it depends completely on the work of Christ. He is the working object of your salvation. What he did on the cross, burial, resurrection, if he's not raised from the dead, you don't get justification. Romans, the fourth chapter. If he's not raised from the dead, there's no justification. And the church was split up on this. There was a division on their theology view of salvation. And so they clear, cleaned it up. They said, look, here's the message. The message is Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. He is, he fulfilled the messianic every messianic thing that was necessary. That's the message, the mechanics. You got to believe that to be saved. You can't add nothing to it, add nothing to it. You know how many people do not like that message? Do you know how many people in the doctrinal church don't like that message? That disturbs the fire out of me. Oh, they say, well, you know, God, God, God's in control of that. He does all that. Yeah, and he's told us how he does it. He's told us exactly how he does it. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works. Of course, he tells you how he does it. Of course, the Lord saves you. And listen, you're saved on his terms, not yours. You don't get saved on your terms. 
Yeah, I hear people say to me, well, Ron, one day I'm going to believe that. Huh. What you've been smoking that would make you believe that? Well, it gets you the idea that you can live and die on your terms. Ephesians 1, and 23, he put all things in subjection. God put all things in subjection under the feet of his son and gave his son as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fulfillment of him who fills all in all. The, listen, not, when, when you get saved, not only is Christ your head, but he is your body. And listen what he does. He is the fulfillment of him who fills all in all. He fills all in all. Think about that. It, he fills all in all. What is this? Where do you get this idea? Well, I just live my life the way I want to. It's my body. I'll do what I want. It's not your body to start with. Well, it's my body. I'll do what I want. No, it's not your body. Are you, do you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead? Yes. Do you believe that by faith? Yes. Then your body's no longer your own, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20. You were bought with a price. Your body's not your own. The, your body was changed that day from flesh to temple, from a physical body to a spiritual body. In the true sense that it's now the temple of God. It's a place where God dwells. It's a naos. We spent 44 years in this church preaching that message. We're in our 45th year. We are not going to budge from it. No matter how much hate mail I get, I'm not budging from it. It'd be my kiss of death. This message has got to be clear and clean, and the mechanics as well. You can't have a clear gospel and a screwy mechanics and have a gospel salvation. You got to be on the money on both ends of that. Well, I'll get saved in my time. I'll get saved the way I want to get saved. Now you won't. How about it, Paul? Is that how do you how do you feel about that, Paul? Tell us about it. Well, I was riding a donkey on my way to do what I was going to do, and I was going to do it the way I wanted to. And boy, I tell you, that was a day of my life. I found out that day who's really in charge. Now, maybe you need to get knocked off whatever you're riding and put on the ground. For you to understand, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Quit that foolishness. Well, I'm in charge. That's immaturity. That's a 1 Corinthians 13, 11 concept of mentality. That's childish behavior. It's childish. Well... Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. He says it in the first chapter of Ephesians. He says it in the fifth chapter. You know what he says about the head? He said, I'm the head of the church because I gave myself up for it. Think about that. You know why I'm the head of the church? Because I died for her. I shed my blood. That's what God required of me to be the head of the church and the savior of the body. Required my blood. Not my sweat, my blood. You think God's going to take anything less than that? You come to salvation on his terms or you don't come. His terms, I say to you. When you read... 
Ephesians 5, you ought to read verse 2 along with verse 25 where he talks about the head. You ought to put those two verses together. Two denominations came, came, came into existence out of the early church. Shouldn't surprise you because you've studied the story of the Garden of Eden. Have you not? All of a sudden, we wound up with two different theological views about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. No kidding. No kidding. So it should surprise you to find two theological views on salvation. No kidding. Which one is the true? Which one is true? Which one does God tell you the most about? Was God's word say? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm telling you some things you ought to believe. Two denominational Christian groups were formed in opposition to one another. One was legalism of salvation. One was grace. It was clear cut. And we still have in existence today. We still have them. It's the number one thing I fight every day of my life. Not my life. I fight it in my ministry. People that think they can screw around with grace. Listen, grace is all about God. It's nothing about you. It's all about God. Just remember, it starts with a G word. A G letter, and you'll be all right. If it starts with an I, then you're in trouble. In Acts 15, 11, here's what they decided. Here's what, here was their, their final theological declaration as a church. They wrote it down into the first church constitutional idea. We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as the Gentiles also are. We believe whether you're Jew or Gentile, you're saved the same way by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. And they wrote it down as a decree. And the one group that started this whole mess on legalism left that conference and went right into another denomination that they'd already had of legalism and is still in existence today. We still fight this battle because the Lord, listen, the Lord is of this opinion and Satan is of that opinion. And what has happened to the church today in the Lord Jesus Christ is what happened in the Garden of Eden. You have God's opinion and you have Satan's opinion. That's why the Word of God is so important. You take it. You take the word of God so lightly in your life, it disturbs me. It ought to be the most important stuff in your life. And every time some issue comes up in your life and you get all screwy in your head about it, you ought to be saying, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And your Bible ought to look like a war zone. It should be worn out and written into and everything. Your Bible ought to look like a resort, not like a resort. Somewhere you go once a year. It ought to look like a war-torn battlefield. Do you know that? You don't open it once in a while. Here's another point. The sign of a healthy church is the Lord adding new members like we read in Acts 9.31. Didn't matter where the church was moving, whether it was in Judea, Galilee, or Samaria, the Lord was adding to it. It increased because the Lord increased it. The Lord added to the church. Do you know what's interesting to me?
I'll, I'll tell you what's interesting to me in just a minute. At the very top of your page, at the very top of your pa paper, I wrote out Acts 2.47. I want to show you something. I want to show you something really important. It's that at the very top of your paper, it's the first paragraph, last Sunday. Last, last Sunday, in Acts 2.47, it says, and the Lord was adding. Now, that's a compound word, and I want to show you because it's important how the Lord does this. It's pros. Pros is, is translated in the Greek, from the Greek to the English, to. But it means face to face. Face to face. Because you're putting something. You're putting, you put, the, the other word is to place or to set or to put. And what it, what it means is personal. When you put these two words together, he's doing something personally, face-to-face -face with it, hands-on, we would say. Today, we, it would be a phrase like hands-on. He's a hands-on teacher. He's a hands-on coach. He's a hands-on guy, right? He's a hands-on executive. And he engages and gets up close and personal. That's his word personal and the Lord was adding personally isn't that interesting listen now we saw it with see it, it, that's true with your life listen the Lord personally personally added you to the church when you got saved listen to me now he did that as much as he did with Saul of Tarsus when he put him on the ground, got his attention, and brought him into the kingdom. Just, was that personal? <laughs> Boy, Saul of Tarsus thought it was. That's this word. The Lord got in his face. The Lord took personal. Lord was personal with him. That's his word. You watch for that because it's used a lot, the word added. The Lord added. He took personal. L let me show you Colossians 1.13. Let me, let me show you how this thing worked. Here is every unbeliever in Adam. In spiritual darkness. In the domain of darkness. It's one of the 13 judicial charges. You know, alienated, under the curse, blinded, right? That whole deal. 13, under 13 judicial charges. Here he is. Colossians 1.13. Every person in this illustration that Paul is going to make in Colossians 1.13 is, lives in the domain of darkness. Now, he's not blind, but he lives in darkness. And the devil tries to convince him that he's blind. See, that's 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. He convinces him that he's blind to the light of the gospel. He deceives him to believe that what you're not seeing is darkness. You're blind. Listen to me. The day you believe that, you're blind. The day you believe that, you're blind to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what God does to the person that says, oh, I don't think, I don't think I, I see, but I think I see darkness. And the guy who says that is positive to God. 
He has God conscious, positive volition that God conscious does. And there's that light in him of positive volition that goes like, no, I don't think I'm blind. I think I see darkness. You can see darkness, can't you? You may not know what it is, but you can see it. Somebody might have to tell you what you see is darkness. And here's what Colossians 1.13 says. The guy who has it never buys into, I'm blind. See, the devil tells you you're blind. You believe it, you're blind. You're blind to the light of the gospel. So that's a spiritual deal. Here's what Paul, here, here's what Paul says. When you were in the domain of spiritual darkness, with that positive devolution towards God, like Cornelius was, God obligates himself to give you gospel hearing. He obligates himself to give you gospel hearing. And when you get gospel hearing, the light shines in your darkness temporarily. It's the light of the gospel, which is the image of God in Christ. And when you believe it, boom, listen, the moment you believe it, listen to what it says. He rescues you. Here's Colossians 1 13. He rescues you. At that moment, he rescues you from that domain of darkness and transfers you, transfers you, transfers you by God's grace, transfers you when you believe. Faith, grace transfers you over to the kingdom of the beloved Son. And there you are, never to return to that state of Adam's sin. Never. It's a permanent transfer from this domain to this domain. It's a transfer that comes by grace, and it comes at one time in your life. That's when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, you were in a domain of darkness. I knew, that, I knew I was in a domain of darkness. When the gospel came to me, I went, I don't know. That's, oh, that sounds way out there. Positive lish and common sense. An old farm boy says, what you got at risk, Ron? Well, if I die and go to hell, oh, that sounds like a risk. What's it going to cost you to get out of this? Nothing. Paid in full. I didn't raise no dummy. Come on, farm boy. Come on, farm boy. You don't have to have a college education to do this. Come on, farm boy. <laughs> Jeez. Come on, farm boy. Stand there. You can get out of this mess. <laughs> don't you know that, people? Saved by grace through faith and not of herself is a gift of God. Listen to, listen, to, listen to Revelation. Now, here we are. Here's our church. Revelation 5, 9, and 10. They sang a new song. Worthy are you, Christ, to take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe, circle that. Every tongue, circle that. Every people, circle that. And every nation, circle that. Because let me tell you, that's why God sends you to the mission field. That's why we go to the world. That's why we have missionaries going. That's why Rick go, goes over to wherever God sends him, and Jackie too. You know why? We go, to, we go to every tribe, every tongue, every language, every different culture, every different nation. God sends us. That's a sign of a healthy church and healthy people. We're about to do this in Moody. We're about to do this in Moody. Moody. 
Anybody who ever goes to a mission field, you better know one thing. You better know that God is sending you. Because if you don't know that, you better stay home. The one person that should always know that. And I'll tell you, the one guy who knows that better than anybody in this room is me. Me. I know that. I know it as well. Paul knew it when God told him to go westward. And he was doing all right where he was. He had something working. Everything was moving good. And God says, ah, we're going westward. It's important. Do you know what's important about these words? Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. You know what's important about that? Now, Don Tool, this is for you, Don Tool. This is, Don's going to love this one. Genesis 10. If you know anything about the post-Diluvian period, when they got off that boat, God sent them to the mission field. And he sent them to every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. That's how he identified them. You look at the 10th chapter, look at verse 5, 20, and 31, and go like cha-ching. <laughs> go cha-ching. Okay, you're going to be amazed at the comparison between this. It is the responsibility of a health, healthy local church to welcome whoever is being saved and being added to the church by the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether they're educated or uneducated. It doesn't matter whether they're male or female rich or poor, black or white, or anything else. If the Lord brings them in, we're to love on them, train them, prepare them, and send them back out. Send them out better, better than they came, not worse, better. Better in regard to who they believe is the champion of their life. The great champion of your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the champion of your life. You have no idea how much he loves you. You have no idea how much he cares about you. You have no idea the ministry that he has set you into that he wants you to exercise. <coughs> that right, Rita? Rita, is that right? You take somebody in off the street. You care for them and try to prepare them for dying, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, to have a better life than he's had before he came. <laughs> to take somebody of the world to suck all the goodness out of their life and left an empty shell. Reed and Frank pick them up. Put the love of God back in his life and prepare him to die and go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in the good place, in a good place forever. That's what this stuff is all about, people. This is what this stuff's about. And tell me you're not better for having done that. Tell me that's not missionary work. This is what this is about. This is what this is about. <laughs> if you want some good example of this, you should read carefully Acts 10 and 11. Put your Bible in your bathroom and read Acts 10 and 11 this next week. Won't take any more time out of your life. It's so important. I call it comfort reading. You should read that and pay attention to missionary evangelism. How, in, how concerned is God? Here is Cornelius, a Roman, a Roman centurion. The Romans who crucified Jesus Christ and have been persecuting. A Roman centurion. God cares for him. He didn't write him off. He wrote him in. 
who's, who, is, who has chose monotheism, the belief in one God, and because of that connected in him. He didn't send him to Rome to sack people. He sent him to Rome to get saved. <laughs> I don't know why you think God sends you certain places, but keep that in mind why he sends you certain places. Just keep that in mind. What a wonderful story that is. Let me close. The Lord's adding believers to the body of Christ. When he's doing it, it's a normal growth pattern. Acts 5.14 says, multitudes of men and women were constantly being added to their number. Evangelism is one way that people are added to the, to the church. Another way believers are at, another way addition to the church is our believers who desire spiritual growth. They're tired of being a baby because they're not being fed. They want meat and they've been on milk. Or immature believers who have a sense of growth for ministry. What does God want to do with my life? I feel like I ought to be doing something for the Lord. What could that possibly be? That's an immature believer uh, talking about some things within himself. And he has to be in a place or, or she has to be in a place where you can spiritually grow up in the word of God so that the word of God begins to operate your life. Then all this stuff begins to be sensible in your life. Like Acts 20, 32, the word of God's grace is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. You know, that's an inheritance now. That's not, a, that's not the inheritance later. That's the inheritance now. God's grace able to build you up and give you an inheritance. I gave you a bunch of scriptures in there. Be well worth your time. I want to close this morning with this idea. Normal and abnormal subtraction. See, what worries me is not addition. It don't, don't bother any pastor, addition. I mean, addition, you go, well, we will so soon outgrow our church. Nobody worries about that. What you worry about is subtraction. What's going on that causes subtraction? You always pay attention to subtraction. Now, you have normal, there's normal subtraction. Here's normal subtraction. People die. You have funerals. People move, jobs, marriage. There are a lot of reasons why people move. They move for a few years, come back. They may move and never come back. People move. So you have these normal kind of things. Some, some, some believers in your church become inactive because of old age and disability. They shouldn't be forgotten. But they become inactive. You don't see them around anymore. New people come in. They don't know who these were. And so we try to remind them of those things. Every church has normal subtractions. What you pay attention to are the ones that are not normal. I call them abnormal subtractions. Apathy. An, an example of apathy is Hebrews 10, 25. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. I tell you this all the time. When the assembly is called, assemble. When the assembly call is given, assemble. Why? Because God is trying to prepare you, not just in your own personal growth, but in the growth of the body of Christ. You don't just assemble for one purpose, you assemble for a multitude of purposes. Spiritual gifts to function, prayer lists, prayer, all these different kinds of things that come from interaction. You don't become a body, you don't become part of the body of Christ to become isolated.
I can't tell you how many people say to me, well, Rod, why don't you just hang the shingle up? Just hang it up. Just hang it up. Based on my age, hang it up. You've done your job. Hang it up. And do something else. Listen, why don't you why don't you have an internet ministry? You've got all this wisdom. You've got all this information. You could go on the internet. For me to go on the internet, I would be an internet. Listen, God called me to pastor a church. I didn't want to do this. I'd rather do anything than pastor a church. I didn't have a choice in it. He put the squeeze on me and said, you're going to go into the church. You complain too much about it. Get in there and fix it. So I did. So I am. So I, I stopped standing on the sideline complaining. I jumped in the middle of it. Okay, that's fair, Lord, that's fair. That's fair. If you don't like what's going on, change it. That's fair, Father, that's fair. Then I discovered when you're ordained to do that, it's a lifetime ordination. I go like, what? I don't know that ahead of time. Well, it's because you didn't read. You didn't, you didn't read the fine print. <laughs> with that but I tell you what I am I'm a face to face guy I'm a prosthesomy I'm a prosthesomy I'm a, I'm a hands on guy I'm not an internet guy I'm not a guy who writes books I, I would like to I write books all the time and they, they never go anywhere I just do it for fun that's not, who, that's not who God called me to be. God called me to be a pastor, teacher, a face-to-face -face personal guy with hands-on. Now, listen to me. I'll meet with you any time of the, any time of the week. You want to meet at 9 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, before you go to work? I could care less. This wonderful church pays my salary. The only thing I've downsized in my life has been my salary, if you pay any attention to it. You've seen I've downsized my salary. Now, you don't pay attention, but that's all right. It's the only thing I've downsized in my life. No, I don't take from you what I don't need. I don't take a penny from you I don't need. We, when, if you want to meet other days of the week, if you want to eat meat other times of the day, I'm open. But when the assembly is called, you need to assemble. You owe that to me because I owe that to you. Okay? Okay? We're, we're a wonderful church. Listen, here's what you don't realize because you don't pay attention to this stuff like I do. Our average, our average, our medium age in our congregation, because we do everything adult-wise here, is 57 And if I added teenagers in my assembly like most churches do, my average age would be about 54. Do you know why? Listen to me. That's a normal church. The difference is, is that we're losing our young people, our young married couples. We're not able to hold them right now. And we've got, that's got to change. We've got to be able to be in a, an environment where young people can actually buy homes, raise children in a community and stay with us. That's why we're going to Moody. That's why we're going to Moody. It's affordable. Young couples, it's affordable. 
It's progressive. It's moving up. We're a normal church. If you went and did a census of any of the churches out there, you'd find out we're a pretty much a normal church. We're light in some areas. We're light in some areas. We're a pretty normal church. And if you compare this to most churches, we're way above normal. Way above normal in what we do. I tell you that because this is who we are as a church. And so, our Father, we thank you today that the Lord Jesus Christ adds to the church, adds a lot of stuff to the church, doesn't he? People, ministry, growth, joy. Oh, there's so many things. And we're so thankful for it. We're so thankful for it. We're thankful for everything. We pray, Father, we're in that season of wait. Make us patient with it. We all have wonderful ministries going on in our life as a church. May we be able to add more people into the mix of spiritual growth and maturity. I hear such wonderful reports from people who take the Lord into the most difficult job descriptions. In some of the toughest businesses, fire departments, police stations, high schools, middle schools, children, educational systems, restaurants, We're here to serve one another and, and beyond. And I pray, Father, you would encourage our hearts. We've been a healthy church. We are a healthy church, and we maintain that. I pray you would encourage us as we take our offering to understand that we give as the Lord has nudged us, pushed us, and encouraged us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit of the Word of God in our soul. We don't give out of some kind of legalistic system. We give out of a grace system, the furtherance of the kingdom. Support our missionaries. To support our people in-house that have great ministries going on. To do whatever we can to keep them afloat. And support them. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.